episode 88. But I suppose when you've been dragged up by muggles, even the Weasley's hovel smells okay. Harry grabbed hold of George. Meanwhile, it was taking the combined efforts of Angelina, Alicia, and Katie to stop Fred leaping on Malfoy, who was laughing openly. Harry looked around for Madame Hooch, but she was still berating Crab for his illegal bludger attack. Or perhaps, said Malfoy, leering as he backed away, you can remember what your mother's house st- Dank like Potter, and Weasley's pigsty remind you of it. Harry was not aware of releasing George. All he knew was that a second later, both of them were sprinting at Malfoy. He had completely forgotten the fact that all the teachers were watching. All he wanted to do was cause Malfoy as much pain as possible. With no time to draw out his wand, he merely drew back the fist clutching the snitch and sank it as hard as he could into Malfoy's stomach. Harry! Harry! George! No! He could hear girls' voices screaming, Malfoy yelling, George swearing, a whistle blowing, and the bellowing of the crowd around him, but he did not care. Until somebody in the vicinity yelled, Impedimenta! And only when he was knocked over backward by the force of the spell did he abandon the attempt to punch every inch of Malfoy he could reach. What do you think you're doing? screamed Madame Hooch as Harry leapt to his feet again. It was she who had hit him with the impediment jinx. She was holding her whistle in one hand and a wand in the other. Her broom lay abandoned several feet away. Malfoy was curled up on the ground, whimpering and moaning, his nose bloody. George was sporting a swollen lip. Fred was still being forcibly restrained by three chasers, and Crab was cackling in the background. I've never seen behavior like it. Back up to the castle, both of you, straight to your head of house's office. Go, now! Harry and George marched off the pitch, both panting neither saying a word to each other. The howling and jeering of the crowd grew fainter and fainter until they reached the entrance hall, where they could hear nothing except the sound of their own footsteps. Harry became aware that something was still struggling in his right hand, the knuckles of which he had bruised against Malfoy's jaw. Looking down, he saw the snitch's silver wings protruding from beneath his fingers, struggling for release. They had barely reached the door of Professor McGonagall's office when she came marching along the corridor behind them. She was wearing a Gryffindor scarf, but tore it from her throat with shaking hands as she strode toward them, looking livid. In, she said furiously, pointing to the door. Harry and George entered. She strode around behind her desk and faced them, quivering with rage as she threw the Gryffindor scarf onto the floor. Well, she said, I have never seen such a disgraceful exhibition. Two unto one, explain yourselves. Malfoy provoked us, said Harry stiffly. Provoked you, shouted Professor McGonagall, slamming a fist onto her desk so that her tartan biscuit tin slid sideways off it and burst open, littering the floor with ginger newts. He just lost, hadn't he? Of course he wanted to provoke you. But what on earth he can have said that justified what you do? He insulted my parents, snarled George, and Harry's mother. But instead of leaving it to Madame Hooch to sort out, you two decided to give an exhibition of muggle dueling, did you? Bellowed Professor McGonagall. Have you any idea what you... (coughs) George and Harry both spun around. Dolores Umbridge was standing in the doorway, wrapped in a green tweed cloak that greatly enhanced her resemblance to a giant toad, and smiling in the horribly sickly, ominous way that Harry had come to associate with imminent misery. May I help, Professor?
too mechanical, asked Professor Umbridge in her most poisonously sweet voice. Blood rushed into Professor McGonagall's face. Help, she repeated in a constricted voice. What do you mean, help? Professor Umbridge moved forward into the office, still smiling her sickly smile. Hey, I thought you might be grateful for a little extra authority. Harry would not have been surprised to see sparks fly from Professor McGonagall's nostrils. You thought wrong, she said, turning her back on Umbridge. Now, you two had better listen closely. I do not care what provocation Malfoy offered you. I do not care if he insulted every family member you possess. Your behavior was disgusting, and I am giving each of you a week's worth of detention. Do not look at me like that, Potter. You deserve it. And if either of you ever... <laughs> Professor McGonagall closed her eyes as though praying for patience as she turned her face toward Professor Umbridge again. Yes. I think they deserve rather more than detentions, said Umbridge, smiling still more broadly. Professor McGonagall's eyes flew open. But unfortunately, she said, with an attempt at a reciprocal smile that made her look as though she had lockjaw, it is what I think that counts, as they are in my house, Dolores. Well, actually, Minerva, simpered Umbridge, I think you'll find that what I think does count. Now, where is it? Cornelius just sent it. I mean, <laughs> she gave a little false laugh as she rummaged in her handbag. The minister just sent it. Ha, ah, yes. She had pulled out a piece of parchment that she now unfurled, clearing her throat fussily before starting to read what it said. <laughs> Educational decree number 25. Not another one, exclaimed Professor McGonagall violently. Well, yes said Umbridge, still smiling. It's a matter of fact, Minerva, it was you who made me see that we needed a further amendment. You remember how you overrode me when I was unwilling to allow the Gryffindor Quidditch team to be formed? How you took the case to Dumbledore, who insisted that the team be allowed to play? Well, now I couldn't have that. I contacted the minister at once, and he quite agreed with me that the High Inquisitor has to have the power to strip pupils of privileges, or she, uh, that is to say, I, would have less authority than common teachers. And you see now, don't you, Minerva, how right I was in attempting to stop the Gryffindor team reforming? Dreadful tempers! Anyway, I was reading out our amendment. <coughs> the High Inquisitor will henceforth have supreme authority over all punishments, sanctions, and removal of privileges pertaining to the students of Hogwarts, and the power to alter such punishments, sanctions, and removal of privileges as may have been ordered by other staff members. Signed, Cornelius Fudge, Minister of Magic, Order of Merlin, First Class, etc., etc. <laughs> she rolled up the parchment and put it back into her handbag, still smiling. So, I really think I will have to ban these two from playing Quidditch ever again, she said, looking from Harry to George and back again. Harry felt the snitch fluttering madly in his hand. Ban us? he said, and his voice sounded strangely distant. From playing ever again? Yes, Mr. Potter. I think a lifelong ban ought to do the trick, said Umbridge, her smile widening still further as she watched him struggle to comprehend what she had said. You and Mr. Weasley here, and I think to be safe, this young man's twin ought to be stopped too. If his teammates had not restrained him, I feel sure he would have attacked young Mr. Malfoy as well. I will want their broomsticks confiscated, of course. I shall keep them safely in my office to make sure there is no infringement of my ban.